Metro News. Calls for better stock tracking in the cattle industry. A new course serves up skills for men's cooking. And female football stars make a play for the future. Kia ora, good evening. Welcome to your local news brought to you by the students of the New Zealand Broadcasting School. With the dairy industry in crisis due to the Mycoplasma bovis outbreak, farmers are now saying stock tracking systems are crucial to containing the disease. Officials have had a tough job tracing infected animals and working out where they came from. Jack Loder is covering the story. For Southbridge farmer Michael Woodward, whose herd's clear, proper tagging of animals is a key to beating Mycoplasma bovis. So I think farmers have pretty quickly become aware of how important it actually is and how how poor some of the farmers have actually been adhering to what the rules were. As the government's declared war on the cow disease wanting it eradicated, it's become clear many farmers were ignoring the National Animal Tagging and Tracing System called NATE. This has caused big problems trying to trace infected herds. Now farmers are realising it's more important than ever. I think um, a, a greater accountability on poor record keeping will be uh, laid down. The government's decision to eradicate was controversial and is supported by the main farmer groups like Federated Farmers and Dairy NZ. There is no treatment for Ambovis, um, hence why we have to uh, try and eradicate it rather than try and treat it. It will take some time though. So what's going to happen from this point onwards is there will be a time when a farm will be killed out or cleared out and that will be at the sort of end of the normal season. She says people shouldn't worry about drinking milk from infected cows. There's no human health risk and meat and milk is still safe to eat. There's now a plan to kill 150,000 cows nationwide, a move Michael Woodward is in favour of because doing nothing would be worse. I think we've got a very good shot at eradication. It may not be overnight. And, you know, it is going to be a yearly, um, a, a multiple year approach that we're going to have to go through. MPI officials predict it'll take 10 years to get rid of the disease and cost around $900 million. Can you rely on your neighbour in an emergency? A group of sprayed and Heathcote residents are making sure they're prepared if the city has another major nat natural disaster. Megan Thompson checks out their plan. Hello Judy. Hello Robert. How Thank you? you for letting me come and talk to you about neighbourhood support. Judy Rooney's the latest to sign up to the Neighbourhood Support Group. You should never get to know your neighbours when you're up to your armpits in, in mud or your slush or whatever. It's not the best time. The best time to know your neighbours is before it all happens. Just it's helping well, small communities in Canterbury come together. It gives a community spirit um, and a companionship, uh, which I think is an important thing in any community. Well, if anything goes wrong, you know you've got neighbours on hand and especially one like Robert. Natural disasters here have raised awareness that communities need to be better prepared. The effect of the Christchurch earthquakes was the incentive to do something about it and neighbours could look after each other. It doesn't stop there. The junior neighbourhood support group is starting the connecting at a young age. We're hoping that as they grow older, they've taken on this uh, feeling within themselves, this sort of internal feeling of helping others is good, building my community is good for everybody. Junior neighbourhood support are for students in years 6, 7 and 8 in Christchurch schools. There are 11 schools already in the programme, but they hope there'll be more. I do encourage them to you know, think through what, what could be something that could benefit their community and their schools. These groups are helping create a safer community. Christchurch would be one of the safest places in New Zealand. The fear of crime is out of proportion to the reality of crime. It's all about one thing. Neighbours helping neighbours. Megan Thompson, <laughs> Metro News. Ramadan, the time of month where Muslims fast for the month, is currently underway. Lydia Clark heads to the local mosque to find out what it's all about. Prayer time at Christchurch's mosque. But this month, something's different. None of these men have eaten all day. That's because it's Ramadan, where Muslims don't eat during daylight hours. But there's more to it than that. It's a time where there's almost like a forced mental change in you. Um, with regards to um, food, mentality, interactions with people, everything. Actually uh, makes us a better person. 
better people uh, when we fast. Ramadan starts on the ninth month of the Islamic calendar, which this year runs from May the 16th to June the 14th. But what's it like to take part? I think there's there's an amazing community in, in Christchurch. They're certainly branching out and getting bigger and stronger. Well, I really would say Christchurch is exceptional in terms of you know, experiencing Ramadan here. In fact, it's probably my favourite. Yeah, I think in New Zealand because uh, you've got such a beautiful, diverse community, so you're really privileged to be able to sort of experience, experience multiple cultures in sort of in one day. New Zealand's also a popular country to experience Ramadan. You can start eating earlier because in the winter the days are very short. When you look at places like Poland and overseas where they're possibly fasting 22 hours a day or it, it's ludicrous. I have a friend in, in Sweden, they, they fast for 20, 20 hours. Around the world Muslims are counting down to the end of Ramadan where they will have a special feast and that's in a week. Lydia Clark, Metro News. Māori across the country are calling for Matariki, Māori New Year, to be celebrated as a public holiday. Wellington Mayor Justin Lester and TV presenter Kānoa Lloyd both support the move, saying it's long overdue. Iwi and Kura Nationwide will celebrate Matariki over the next month. After the break, the football ferns pass on some inspiration and a class is helping young mums find their feet. My name is Ella Cook, I'm a television production manager in London. I work for a company called Red House Television. I work on property shows, comedy and entertainment. I worked as the production assistant on New Zealand's Got Talent on Target on What Now. I came to London nearly four years ago now. Didn't have any issues finding a job at all. I went to a company called Hattrick Productions. We won a BAFTA last year as well as were nominated this year. To even be nominated and go to the awards was something I never ever thought that I would ever do. But then to also win it and go up on the BAFTA stage was just a brilliant feeling. I love living in London. Definitely a big change from living in New Zealand. There's so many people, it's so busy and bustling all the time. I also love being able to just go to the theatre or see something different every night. The professionalism that we are taught at broadcasting school really helps in the wider world. I had my degree on my CV as well as the work experience that I'd gained after my internship. I would never have thought that I'd get this far. It's the best thing that I ever did for my career. There's no way that I would be where I am today without the degree that I have. Welcome back. When the football ferns take on Japan this weekend, the women are expecting a tough match. And in the thick of it, a Christchurch player. Aaron Darman catches up with Annalie Longo and the young players she inspires. Annalie Longo, one of the most capped football ferns ever, training and coaching on a cold night at Christchurch's English Park. Oh, well done, well done. Yellow's your ball. She's Yellow's played over ball. 100 times for the national team, but that doesn't stop Longo from contributing at provincial and club levels. It's important to give back and, yeah, I just like being amongst it and, and watching the girls kind of have those dreams. She was named New Zealand's best women's player last year. I think the, the more they can see us as football ferns as hopefully role models um, and the opportunities that now the sport brings for females, I think definitely hopefully more girls and, and parents and coaches want to get involved in the game. Canterbury Pride coach Alana Gunn says having Longo involved with the team is special. It's awesome, I mean, for any, not just young players, but for any player to be on the pitch um, training beside her. Um, she's just such a great role model. For many of the girls, it's a dream come true. Oh, it's very surreal. Like, I never thought I'd be with Annalie Longo playing with her. It's really exciting. It's a big name. I'm playing with her. It's just, yeah, it's amazing. Women's football in New Zealand is fast developing as an equal to the men's game. Only recently the country's governing body announced equal working conditions for both the All Whites and football ferns. Having these players give back to the community is an important step in inspiring the future of New Zealand football. Couldn't be more excited for the future ahead and, and not just us girls that are playing at the moment but for the little girls growing up. Mainland football says the future of women's sport is in a good place. People are really getting behind women's sport, not just football actually, but I think women's sport in the whole country is on a bit of a crest of a wave, which I think is awesome. Longo will swap out a cold night in Christchurch for Windy Wellington on Sunday 
as the football ferns face Japan in their first home match in the capital for nearly 30 years. Aaron Darman, Metro News. Middle Eastern culture has come to Christchurch in the form of dance. A group of women are trying, are practicing four times a week to bring some of the culture here. So Luke Hempelman goes along to see what it's all about. Uh, I'm uh, office manager at Shoe Shop. Uh, I'm an itinerant music teacher. Those are their day jobs. But by night, these women bring a taste of the Middle East to Christchurch. Soulstar Tribe is a tribal belly dancing collective aimed at getting women together from all walks of life. There's no set choreography in tribal belly dancing. You learn various moves and then get creative. We've got a leader and followers and we have a language of movement combos that we use with cues. So it's like Simon Says a little bit. All about making friends and having a good time. I've definitely met people I would not have met you know, from different areas of life. It's not all fun and games though, it's also a great way to stay fit. Instead of going to a gym and you're just, you know, working, slogging away, this is like you get exercise but you also get to have the fun, you get to dress up. But for the group, it was also a way to get back on their feet after the 2011 quakes. And I started dancing about two weeks after the big earthquake because I thought if I didn't do something to get out, I would never go out. And none of them plan to stop anytime soon. I wondered if I was getting too old, but nah, I'm going to keep going. <laughs> keep going while I can. They're encouraging all women of any age and any background to get on down and give it a go. Luke Hempelman, Metro News. The journey into motherhood can be a difficult one, especially if none of your friends have swapped their nights out for nappies. Megan Thompson visits a group helping young mums find their feet. These young mums and their children are here to share their motherhood experiences. The group is proving age doesn't make a difference when raising a child. Our aim is just to help them feel less isolated and um, help them connect with other young girls that are, um, that are like them, that can understand where they're at. The Young Ones and Shuffle Bums group is designed for young women under the age of 25 to come and feel supported with other mums going through the same thing. I just turned 21 once I'd had my child and there wasn't a lot of support. It was really hard to get into a group we actually felt comfortable. Some feeling excluded because they're single, younger or their pregnancies were unplanned. They actually feel quite marginalised and um, there's, a, there's still a very big stigma around being a young mother. Um, so and that's really the reason why this was set up. The group helps fill in gaps other agencies miss. You can go and ask someone for help um, for uh, you know housing, for food, for schooling, for getting help with candies, things like that. But on an emotional level, it's hard to actually interact with people when you're young and they're a lot older. These mums find talking with others helps. I think it's critical. The mental health outcomes are so much more positive when we are connected to our community. Organisers say it's all about planting seeds for the next generation. Megan Thompson, Metro News. Imagine hauling a sled for 560 kilometres across the Greenland ice cap in Antarctic conditions. To make it even harder, the weight you're pulling is heavier than you are. Luke Hempelman joins us in studio with Holly Woodhouse, who's just returned from a trip of a lifetime. So Holly, welcome into the studio and welcome back to New Zealand. Thank how, you. Is, how is it being back? It's very nice being back. Uh, just, the, just the little things in life that you really appreciate that you didn't quite have on the crossing Greenland. Yeah, for sure. So what kind of little things? What's your favourite part about being home? Uh, the obvious, like eating some fresh food, but also just uh, the ease of going to the bathroom <laughs> and not getting frostbite on your ass. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine that'd be quite difficult. Yeah. What sort of things were you eating on the trip then? Oh, we had we had good food, so breakfast would be a porridge and then uh, sort of throughout the day it was snacking and noodles for lunch and then we had these great dehydrated meals. I never thought I'd say dehydrated 
dehydrated meals were great, but they were just so hearty after a really long day walking. I can imagine, yeah, a yeah. long day, really cold day, a warm meal would yeah, be great. Yeah. Uh, we do have some pictures of the uh, trip, which we'll bring up on the screen over there. So obviously the expedition was 560 kilometres long, and you're dragging a steed that's 60 kgs, and you yourself, I think you said you were 54 kilos at the start, and now you're 47, so yeah. how was that for you? Uh, I, I found the pulling the sled physically very challenging, yeah, just because of my size, and the terrain wasn't f totally flat, uh, especially getting onto the ice cap. It was very rolling and icy, and so we were sort of ha having to turn around and drag our sleds, and we'd take our skis off and sort of help each other p pull our sleds up. So that was a real challenge, but uh, sort of through the middle it did flatten off, which m made it easier. Took a bit of a load off, yeah. yeah. So that was, would you say that was your biggest challenge? What else did you find challenging? Yeah, definitely for me, uh, the physical challenge was, was really uh, soul-searching at times. Um, and I suppose, you know, the length of it, 29 days, is quite a long time of sort of walking for 10 to, 10 to 12 hours a day. And then, you, and then you'd get to camp and it would take two hours to set up camp, an hour to boil your water. So it was just really trying to get into that routine uh, that, was, that was another challenge. And, you know, some people found, you know, we were, we were a team, sort of working in that team environment, the challenge of the food, the same food, day in, day out. It's also something quite different to have to deal with. But, yeah, yeah. I mean, overall it was just absolutely incredible. Yeah, for yeah. sure, because what was the highest point of the trip? What would you say your favourite part was then? Oh, look, uh, possibly looking back, you all group it together, but on our very last day, we had really challenging weather while we were there, and then <clears throat> on our last day, we were pushed for time, and it just turned out to be the most fantastic day. Finally, the, the conditions were great. The sled slid easily over. It was quite firm and icy. Uh, and we could see these absolutely stunning mountains sort of right on the horizon and we knew we were almost there so it was a really great way to finish to finish the expedition finish which had off. been really tough um, you know on a really on a really high note yeah for sure yeah. so what have you got planned for your next adventure then <laughs> oh, I, uh, who knows but uh, I have no doubt something will pop up I've got a couple of things in the pipeline but nothing really planned just oh, yet yeah I'm sure you'll find something oh, thank yeah, you absolutely. so much for your time Holly really thank appreciate you. you coming in thank you Thanks Luke. After the break, bars ditch the straws to save the environment and meet the men sharpening their skills in the kitchen. My name's Alistair Coburn. Uh, I'm the station producer for Classic FM. So we're in London, we've got eight radio stations and two TV stations here. So I've been doing this job about two years. Got a phone call while I was in uh, the middle of Europe saying you've got a job interview in London. Worked out quite well. London's the greatest city on earth, I think. There's so much to do here. It's, it's just such a vibrant place. My first year in the UK, I think we saw about 10 different countries. Two weeks ago, we were in Wales. A week before that, we were in Prague. It's really amazing. I mean, Classic FM, We've got 5.3 million listeners every week, so it's more than the entire New Zealand population. I'll be writing promos, writing trails, writing imaging, writing commercials as well. I got nominated for a Sony Radio Award for a promotional campaign which I worked on. The skills that I've got from, from my study, they really stand up. It taught me a lot about how the entire radio industry works, like from sales to production to on-air to writing. Once you're done, you've got the internship, you get straight into a job, and from there, you're off. I mean the world's your oyster, basically. Welcome back. Men tend to get a bad rap in the kitchen, but some Christchurch blokes are exploring ways to unleash their inner Jamie Oliver. Our reporter, Abby Wakefield, heads along to see what's cooking. Tonight's menu includes steak, chips, coleslaw, and a beetroot feta and spinach salad. Men to Cook is a course run for guys who are widowed, single or just want to improve their confidence in the kitchen. Yeah, well you're getting men coming in like-minded as well, wanting to actually learn something. Just a minute. I need to practice. When you live at home and if, if one of you is taken ill, you, you need to take over. I've come for the, just to get a bit of confidence. The program is funded by the City Council, but those taking part make a small donation. 
This has been a really very, very successful program. Doing something like this, it gets them out also socialising with other men and getting talking to other men in the community. Census figures show an increasing number of people living alone, people divorced, separated or widowed. The latest census has the total at 204,000. And it's programs like this that have a point of difference. Um, that, that this is a program that is run for men by men. And it gives them the skills that they've never really known about cooking. For many of them it's just been a woman's domain in their lives or their wives' domain. Only seven to eight men can fit in the kitchen at a time. So for the next segment of the course, they're looking at the possibility of having more courses on different nights so that everyone on the waiting list can have a go. Christchurch is the first place in the country to serve up a program like this. The council's expecting other cities to follow suit. Abby Wakefield, Metro News. The Christchurch City Council has a big task ahead sorting out job applications for the new Central City Library. A spokesperson says it's received over 1,000 applications for 45 jobs and staff are required to respond to each one. The $93 million library is due to open later this year. Is this the last straw? Christchurch students are leading the way in reducing the number of straws we use and the waste they create. Our reporter James Regan finds out it's easy to become more environmentally friendly. Ditching the plastic, one straw at a time. Outdoor education student Taylor Polwart has been working with Christchurch bars and restaurants to cut the waste and become plastic straw free. A couple of years ago I saw that video that everyone's probably seen of the, the straw coming out of the turtle's nose and started doing a little bit more investigating into how bad the problem is and you know straws are one of the top ten things found in a beach cleanup. She's pleasantly surprised how keen the bars are to get behind the idea. Everybody we've talked to has been super supportive and everybody's been in the same mind frame that we do need to work towards getting rid of single-use plastic. Sustainability is an important part of the outdoor education program. Her tutor encourages the students to get involved in real-world problems. As students, you know, these people are exploring how they can um, fit in with a, a changing world, you know. Uh, uh, Taking action is incredibly empowering and heroic work. Plastic straws are one of our biggest polluters. A single straw can take over 200 years to break down. Around 1 million seabirds and 100,000 marine animals die each year from plastic straw ingestion. We need to get plastic out of our, out of our lives and, and out of our economy. New Zealand, we're just always super behind for some reason and it's not that hard to get rid of them as we've seen with this action. Earlier in the year the Wellington City Council announced that their waterfront is now 100% straw free so it may be in the coming years bars and restaurants like these in Christchurch may have no choice but to use a more sustainable option. James Regan, Metro News. The City Council is doing its bit to make empty shop windows a little brighter with the help of some local artists. Connor Haley went to see what's lighting things up in the city. Audrey Baldwin's one of the artists whose work will breathe life into the central city. Her winning design called Until Works End features a scene everyone in Christchurch is familiar with. Christchurch is the road cone capital of New Zealand. Yeah, we're really aiming to take something that's familiar and that's usually seen as frustrating. No one, no one likes roadworks. Christchurch is full of dull, empty shop windows. So the City Council set up a special project for artists to give the city a bit of colour. They held a competition called Shop Op. Martin Kaczynski wants to help artists transform the city. The so Shop Op's really an opportunity to show the city, show building owners, show artists that uh, we have these great new opportunities for um, activation, something the city hasn't seen before. Julianne Eason of Shades Arcade Design Collective was a winner for her mechanical pom poms. I was kind of looking at some pom-poms uh, one day and then it just happened that the same week I went through a car wash and I thought how cool if you, you know we could make these pom-poms really big and have that, that experience that you have when you're going through a car wash. This is Durham Street, one of three potential locations for the artworks to be installed. It has both heavy foot and vehicle traffic making it the perfect place to start livening up the CBD. The artists and council both hope for more projects like this in the future. The designs will be installed by next month, so keep an eye out. Connor Haley, Metro News. And now to the weather. Aaron, how's the weekend looking? 
Well, Charlotte, you might want to pop those extra layers uh, if you're heading outside. It's been another cold, cloudy day for most of the country. Auckland one of the few places to see any sunshine. Christchurch, you hit a low of 1 overnight and a high of 12 this afternoon. You'll need to get the scarves out tomorrow, Christchurch. You will wake up to a fine morning with a low of 6 and some early frost, but things will warm up to 13 by midday. Further south is not looking any better. Timaru, you hit a low of 2, Twizel the coldest at 0, and Ashburton a slightly warmer 5. So you're all in for a chill tonight. It might be time to rug up and get the heater going as temperatures creep to just above 10 degrees throughout the day. Up north, it's the perfect time to hit the hot pools as Hamna faces a low of 6 and Kaikoura reaches a mild 15 on the east coast. In Oxford, temperatures will drop to 9 degrees with winds picking up in the afternoon. Looking ahead, the cold spell will continue throughout the weekend with a chance of rain on Sunday. Do enjoy the rest of your evening. That's all from me. Back to you, Zion and Charlotte. Thanks, Aaron. And that's Metro News for now. For those stories and more, head to our website metronews.co.nz. You can also find us on Instagram and Twitter. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Charlotte Cook. And I'm Zion Dale. Ka kite anō.